Hey everyone, the name's Oscar Flowell. Something the Portal series is quite beloved for is the backstory we see hinted at throughout the games. The Aperture facility is one with a rich history and it's chock full of secrets throughout to learn. Mysteries such as Borealis' sudden disappearance and reemergence in the Arctic, or the character of Doug Ratman, who has gone to become one of the most popular characters in the series despite never once having appeared in an actual game, tell a lot for just how invested people were into the lore for these games. It's clear that even Valve had a lot of fun fleshing out the backstory, as a cohesive enough narrative can be formed in the company's history just by playing Portal 2. Aperture is filled with such a rich history and filled with fan favourites like Ratman and Cave Johnson that Portal 1 feels a little left out, doesn't it? I mean, what more is it to Portal 1? You solve death chambers, fight the Ratman dens, escape, guided by the markings left behind, and he's successfully eliminate GLaDOS. Easiest cake, isn't it? Well, what if I told you that Portal 1 has some lore that's almost on the same level as Portal 2's in depth alone, yet has almost been completely wiped off the surface of the Earth? Yeah, that got you listening. To truly experience the original lore, we need to wipe out temptation to connect with any anything in Portal 2. Let's avoid thinking about Carolyn, Old Aperture, or Wheatley. Forget all of that, we need full one-on-one -on -one contact with Portal. To jump to the very start, you'd think the story would begin with the actual game releasing in 2007, but you'd be dead wrong. Ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary folks, it's time I bring you back to September of 2006. In order to make this video, I dug deep to find information on when people had discovered ApertureScience.com, and sure enough, after a lot of internet archaeology, I think I found information no one else has bought at the archive. On September 18th, 2006, a thread was made on the portal forums of the now defunct Half-Life2.net, a website dedicated to Half-Life 2 and later Source games as a whole. As of the making of this video, this is the earliest surviving thread I could uncover from the depths of internet archaeology of people discovering ApertureScience.com, but this is the oldest preserved I could locate. ApertureScience.com was a website that mysteriously popped onto Portal's Wikipedia page about two weeks prior on September 1st. The person who edited the page and placed his link here was anonymous, and only had one previous interaction with Wikipedia, being edited in Mark Laidlaw's page to update information on it mere minutes prior. After people looked into the reverse DNS of the website, they found that this was an officially Valve-owned site, and even more so, the flash file of the site was running was last modified the day before the site appeared on Wikipedia. Portal was still quite some time until release, and coupled with the fact that Valve confirmed Portal was part of the Half-Life universe beforehand, the fact that they had started what can be considered an ARG, or alternate reality game, for one of the upcoming games got people gripping in their seats for anticipation. So how about we actually check out the website? When you entered the website prior to Portal's release, this is all you saw, an empty terminal. So obviously, people started typing. First things first, if you type help, you get a fairly jerky response about how the message is assuming you might be asked, actually asking for a plea for help. Besides the obvious mention of a crisis team, there isn't much to work out here. Instead, let's look into the terminal and see what we can find here. You can use any username you want, but the password has to be portals or just portal. After we log in, we get something interesting. This is something that is interfacing with something known as GLaDOS. Us looking into this from the future know that this is the main antagonist of Portal, but in 2006, no one really seemed to know what it could have been, and it easily could have been Aperture's unique operating system for the terminals. The uh, DOS part dips tips off after that, by the way. We even get dates, as GLaDOS seems to be copyrighted in 1982, making Aperture quite old. Typing help again, now that we're logged in, gives us a list of commands to actually put into the terminal. However, a lot of these seem to be broken or don't do much. There's only really one that's notable, and that's the apply command, so how about we do that? Doing apply brings us into a very long application process. We get quite the sense of how Aperture is a bit crazy. There's a lot of nonsensical questions that are asked for applying test subjects, and a bit of a fascination with Cake. This is coupled to the fact that an ASCII art of Cake will sometimes flash on the screen briefly. We are really getting those subliminal message vibes, aren't we? Something I quite enjoy about this application process is, is the little nods we get. For example, the question of how long someone's been silent for seems to be a nod to the fact that protagonists in Valve games have mostly been silent, which is quite amusing. Triggering an investigation interview you want to domesticate a large egret? What the f- Once you finish the application form, you have to state your unique identifier provided to you at the start. Even if you do it correctly, you get the response a crisis team is coming to our workstation to deal with us. Now, that seems to be all there is for this website, but there is one last secret. Throughout the entire application, there is a series of letters that will randomly flash as you progress. Putting all these letters together will bring you the phrase, the cake is a lie. You can actually use this as a command on the website, bringing us the final secret, and this is the most telling what Aperture is. We get a mention from someone who has hacked in the terminal, possibly an employee, and we get mentions that Aperture Science is currently in lockdown and no one's been allowed to leave the building. Alongside it, we get a security feed showing us what the person mentions called a relaxation vault. It doesn't have any doors. 
Pressing return on the page as person instructions brings us to a sort of spending spreadsheet. In the vein of how I have really old PC games will have boss screens to quickly tap into if you're at work to look productive because your boss walked by your computer. On the spreadsheet, you see mentions of flour, which is understandable, and you need to make cake. We see also see thumbtacks and INTUB-XLG. I've tried to research what this is and found a pretty humorous forum argument from 2007 about whether it's referring to an incubation tube or an intubation tube. Both sides have val valid points and I'll bring this up later in the video which released really the post-release lore. So, what does the original version of ApertureScience.com tell us about Aperture? Just from what I can tell about Aperture in the promotional me media and this website, Aperture is a corporation that pioneered portal technology and has some currently unknown connection to the Half-Life universe. They also seem to be obsessed with cake and are extremely concerned of keeping control of their employees. The facility is in lockdown for an unknown reason and a enrichment center is being constructed, which may be an analogy with Portal still being in development in this period. A lot of theories were thrown around at the time as to what Aperture was up to. A prevalent theory was at the time was Aperture was in lockdown due to the Portal Storms, a phenomenon mentioned in the Half-Life series, occurring across the world in the aftermath of the Black Mesa incident. Aside from the crazy crack theories that occasionally pop up, there isn't really anything more we can discuss. So how about we move on to when Portal 1 actually released? Now, the date is October 10th, 2007, and Portal is just being released as part of the Orange Box. Let's take a look and see what we can find out. When we start the game, we're in the Affirmation Realization Vault. The pod bed we just come out mentions an ID 234, and we're only given a toilet, radio, empty mug, and a clipboard displaying the challenges we we'll face. It's clear to assume then the Realization Vaults are not permanent residents. We wake up, do our business, and start testing. Throughout the game, we know some glaring bits about the facility. There's no one observing us through the windows, and the AI guiding us is glitchy and the facility seems like faltering on the edge of stability. The Hala connection? We have it now. Aperture is in direct competition with Black Mesa funding as revealed to us through a slideshow. And in the test chambers, we can see the people who tried to escape it for us, residing in the industrial backseat of Aperture, slowly driving themselves mad, only sustained by a diet of beans, milk, and water. You can see how the torn open computers use makeshift ovens to heat up the beans. The writings on the wall left behind these escapees are incoherent and warning us of the promised cake being a lie. We also see an alternative in Chamber 17 where someone becomes mad as they become obsessed with the companion cube. In the offices, we can find numerous clipboards scattered about. Some are the standard testing signs, other are test error profiles, one of which is us, subject 234, and the other one is a chicken. We even find profiling of the advanced knee replacements, which helps cushion our fall, and even Aperture's gender-neutral polyamory-friendly partnership agreement. Aperture canonically says trans rights, you son of bitches. The picture we get from the Aperture facility is a lot more morbid than the one we saw back on the website in 2006, and the update to the website doesn't help. Do you see the login in Chamber 17's backstage area? What if we plug those into Aperture's terminal? Doing so, a new command is accessible, and this one's called Notes. This brings us a completely new set of information. We now know that Aperture existed as far back to the 1950s selling shower curtains, being considered a low-tech portal. The Eisenhower and the administration eventually contracts Aperture for curtains, and from there on, shower curtains were pretty good decade or so. In 1978, the founder and CEO, Cape Johnson, is actually exposed to Mercury while developing a new secret line of shower curtains. This flips the switch in him as he becomes brain damaged, suffers kidney failure, and is slowly dying, while also being unable to perceive the perception of time correctly. For those who do need it spelled out, that login we just used is Cave Johnson's login. Circling back, in 1986, Aperture learns about Black Mesa's existence, a company who seems to be developing similar port technology, leading to Aperture initiating the construction of GLaDOS to one-up the newfound rival corporation. A decade and some years later, GLaDOS is untested and activated on Bring a Door to Workday, and the notes seem to hint at the fact it went well for GLaDOS, leading people to think that this day was the day she flooded the enrichment center with neurotoxin, as she mentioned in the boss fight prelude. So how about we piece things together? From what we learned back in September 2006, things seem to be relatively unchanged, but now we have some more history. Aperture Science was founded by Cape Johnson in 1953, selling shower curtains, with the name chosen to make the company sound more hygienic. Aperture was eventually contracted by the military, and later, after he was exposed to Mercury in 1978, Cape began a three-tier project for Aperture, one of which ended up transforming into development of portals. After learning a potential camp competitor, being Black Mesa, Aperture attempts to one-up them by developing the genetic life form in their operating system, which is GLaDOS. The company proceeds to fully shift through a portal research, creating a enrichment center to house its testing. GLaDOS is activated for the first time on bringing the world to work day, and it goes horribly wrong as she proceeds to flood the entire facility with neurotoxin, leading to the untimely deaths of many Aperture employees. However, those that survive manage to install a morality core module, preventing her from pumping more neurotoxin. This is explained to us in dialogue with Confronter. But this comes at a cost, Aperture Science is now in lockdown and won't be opened. 
Those who remain in Aperture slowly convert into test subjects, as seen through the application form of employee terminals and ascent into portal testing, most of them perishing, and those who remain slowly go insane and die of starvation, probably. This is likely why Aperture becomes so obsessed with the idea of cake, especially once GLaDOS starts promising it, before the truth being revealed then that it's all a lie. Remember the Intub XLG I mentioned earlier? I believe that may be Incubation Tube ted dedicated to cloning people. GLaDOS mentions he has the capacity to clone people with the idea of Chell having a backup and even calls a mathematical error. Was Chell the 234th test subject or was he clone number 234? The Aperture Science we see in Portal was a science facility gone mad, so obsessed with progress they caused their own downfall and no one won in the end as even Black Mesa destroys himself with the Resonance Cascade. So now we're in 2011, what has changed? For one, in 2010, the ending of Portal was slightly retconned, or was at first a simple fade out with Chell laying on the parking lot, was updated to feature an unseen robot thanking her for assuming the party escort's submission position before she's then dragged back into the facility. This is one of the first real retcons to occur, and Portal 2 would go further. For one, Aperture Science has changed from being entirely childhood and based from, from the 50s to 70s, this occurring in the 40s with the new name of Aperture Fixtures. Cave now buys assault mines in the 1950s to begin Aperture Science, while still keeping at the Shower Curtains. This is quite a shift from the Shower Curtains focused Aperture to exist from the 50s to late 70s to Portal 1, but it helps contextualize the company as one that can more reasonably invent Portal technology. Cave Johnson's poisoning occurs just a little bit later in the timeline, and causes change from Mercury to Moonrock, recontextualizing Cave from being driven to pure insanity from Mercury to becoming desperate and unhinged. He also starts to push for the GLaDOS project as a way to save his life rather than a response to Black Mesa. GLaDOS evolved simply from being an AI to being originally Carolyn, the backbone of the facility during Cave's reign of the company, tying in the lore together. Those writings and ramblings on the walls, they've now been consolidated into one character, being Doug Ratman, whose story is explained in the Lab Rat comic, and is confirmed the only survivor of the Neurotoxin incident. In the same comic, Chell was retconned for being subject 234 twice, she's first sat at 1498, and then changed to number one by Rantman, so she was woken up by GLaDOS first. Everything else, however, is still considered canning according to the official Portal 2 official guide. The three tier project still occurs, albeit after Cave's Moonrock positing in the 80s, and a Portal project is changed to be improving them further, using the new conversion gel, which is so far the most stable portal conductor Aperture has found, meaning that previous usage of materials such as wood as concrete for portal surface attachments may, long may no longer be needed. So there you have it folks, the full history of Portal 1's lore, from the prehistory starting on September 1st, 2006, and going through into Portal's release in 2007, and the eventual changes of retconning with Portal 2. There's a lot of minute detail that could have gone over, and also a lot of other things such as covering the lore in the Portal 2 ARG, but I don't want this video to be as long as the Iceberg one. Regardless of that being a bit of a weird way to end the video, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.